Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERDOP and ESCCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosynsac Consultants and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDOP and ESCCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The event today will consist of a brief overview of CERDOP and ESCCP, followed by the technical portion of the webinar, which features results from DOD-funded research to develop passive sampling methods and institute treatment technologies to facilitate the management of contaminated sediments. First, Dr. Rainer Lohmann from the University of Rhode Island will discuss research efforts to simplify and speed up the acquisition of relevant exposure to contaminants of interest in sediments. Uh, Reiner's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. Then Dr. Kevin Sowers from the University of Mary Maryland, Baltimore County, will share results from a project demonstrating bioaugmentation for the institute treatment of polychlorinated biphenyls in impacted sediments. We will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A session. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in case you experience difficulties with the broadcast platform. Uh, Firefox, IE, or Edge are the most compatible browsers to use. If you lose the content on your screen or if your screen freezes, try keying in Control F5 to perform a hard refresh. If you are accessing the audio to your computer, click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select Test Speakers and Microphones, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to experience difficulties, please call into the conference line shown here. You may also submit a comment using the chat box. Please use the chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A option should be reserved for questions for the speakers. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You can submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions well in advance of the Q&A session. When you do submit your questions, please make sure to add your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify you during the Q&A session. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Andrea Leeson, who is the Deputy Director of CERDIP and ESCCP, as well as the Program Manager for Environmental Restoration. Andrea has been with CERDIP and ESCCP since 2001. Before that, she served as a research scientist at the Patel Memorial Institute, where she conducted research on in-situ bioremediation and the design and in implementation of innovative biological, chemical, and physical treatment technologies for site remediation and industrial wastewater. Andrea received her doctoral degree in environmental engineering from the John Hopkins University. Andrea? Thank you, Rula, and welcome everyone to our webinar series today. This is always one of our favorite things to do when we get to see the projects we funded in CERTIP and ESTCP come to a successful conclusion and then give one of these webinars. Slide nine. Before we jump into the webinar, I'd like to just talk a little bit about who we are. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are sister programs, CERTIP, the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program is our research and development. Um, so much of the work there that we do is at the lab scale, um, some bench, uh, some field scale, but mostly in the lab where we're developing technologies to address the DOD needs in the field. Sister program is ESTCP, the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program, and this is our demonstration and validation program where the knowledge that is coming out of CERTIP is taken once it's mature into the field under ESTCP. Most importantly under ESTCP, eventually what we do with the successful technologies is that we're doing the technology transfer of them and making sure that the end users that need the information are receiving it. And this is one way we do that is through these webinars. Slide 10. We have a couple of big drivers for 
our programs in terms of what we research. First is we are very focused on sustaining the testing and training ranges as well as facilities and operations within the Department of Defense. That can cover a number of areas as shown here from maritime sustainability to sustainable forward operating bases, noise issues, et cetera. Slide 11. We also focus on reducing the current and future liability at our bases. So this can include contamination from past practices and the presentations you'll see today are really addressing this issue in terms of contaminated sediments. And then also we address pollution prevention to control life cycle costs. And that is by developing replacements for some of these hazardous materials throughout the life cycle of the use. Slide 12. So most important for us then is once these technologies are developed, that they get transferred to the proper area. We do this through a number of ways. Slide 13, we have videos, we have in-person training, we have developed an Enviro Wiki similar to Wikipedia, uh, guidance and manuals are often coming out, and then of course the webinar series themselves, which have been a really excellent way to provide a summary of some of the technologies that have been developed under ESTCP and CERTIP. Slide 14, shown here are a number of the upcoming webinars. We actually have these listed throughout the year. So if you go to our website, shown on slide 15, you can see all of the webinars that are available throughout the year. You'll see a registration link for them. And in terms of those, if you are interested in the environmental restoration, we have another opportunity coming up in May focused on some of the emerging contaminants of 1,2,3-trichloropropane as well as EDB. Also, if you'd like to see some of what we do, slide 16 shows a summary of our symposium. It is scheduled this year for December 3 through 5 in Washington, D.C. This is an excellent way to see a summary of everything that we're funding under CERTIP and ESTCP. A lot of good discussions, both platform and poster presentations, so I really encourage you to attend if you have any interest in um, the different technologies that are being investigated under these programs. So at this point, I'll turn it back to Rula. I hope you enjoy the webinar today, and we will chat later. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Reiner Lohmann. Uh, Reiner is a professor of oceanography at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. Since 2000, he has been working on the use of passive samplers to detect various hydrophobic organic contaminants in poor water and the water column. He has authored more than 100 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters and currently serves as the editor for the Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry Journal. Uh, Reiner obtained a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from EHICS in France and a doctoral degree in environmental science from Lancaster University in the United Kingdom. Reiner, please proceed. Thank you, Ruda. Thank you, Andrea, for including me in the webinar and for funding some of my previous work. And a good morning to everybody on the western side of the States and a good afternoon to everybody else. So I was funded initially through a seed project to look at a passive multi-sampling method to measure contaminant bio bioavailability in aquatic sediments. And so I'll talk a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, we propose to look at a passive sample that will work in sediments in situ and pair that with another passive sample that will work in water, both looking for a range of hydrophobic organic contaminants. And of course, then we had to show that they actually provide reasonable results. So we did a ex situ and in situ comparisons for the poor water sampling and active versus passive sampling of the water in our study region. The other part that we're interested in exploring as to what degree the sampler can detect trends of contaminants over space and time, both of which would be very important if you are interested in assessing how far contamination has spread and to what degree remediation is improving trends of contaminants either in the water or in the poor water. I'll finish up by work we're con conducting right now and then summarize some of our main results. So the technical objective was to develop a passive sampling method, and we focused on polyethylene samplers 
sample a wide range of organic contaminants in situ. The particular focus was on polychlorinated dioxins and furans. And as those are present at trace concentrations, we also had to make sure that we have enough material accumulated in our samplers to have a safe analysis in the lab later on. But as part of the uh, sampling, we were also interested in looking for other prominent contaminants of concern that include, in our case, pHs, polychlorinated biphenyls, some legacy pesticides. And for comparison, we looked at some more recent commons of concern, polybrominated diphenyl ethers. And in both cases, we wanted to compare the pest sampling with some other technique, and that would either be an ex situ poor water measurement or an active sampling of water column. And then lastly, we are still working on the fact if, if and how we can deploy these samplers without divers and maybe as importantly, actually retrieve them without divers. So what we started off with several years ago was to construct a sediment pour water, what we call a multi-sampler. And shown here is a very early test object, which has four heavy stainless steel bars for weight. And then we propose two double rims, you see a mesh, and within the mesh is the polyethylene sampler itself. The reason for the size of this sampler is that we, excuse me, the size of the sampler is that we needed enough polyethylene material to accumulate dioxins and furans to overcome our detection limits. This turned out to be a little too unwieldy. It was too much resistance to get it into the sediment that we, in later trials, moved one of the two layers. So it's a single rimmed approach. Our test site is at Newark Base on the East Coast. And Newark Airport is somewhere down here. This is the upper end of Newark Bay. And the Passaic River is a well-known contaminated Superfund site with dioxins and many other hydrophobic organic contaminants. And that's where we performed our, some of our field trials. A quick word on the analysis. Um, we followed the standard US EPA method for dioxins and furans. The analysis we did by a GC triple quad mass spec. And we included some additional QA steps to make sure the numbers are valid. It was a standard Agilent GC. We used two parent-daughter mass transitions to verify the identity of our compounds of interest, as in the dioxin and furans and the other HOCs. And then most importantly, we can detect on the order of 10 tens of picograms on column. And if you now, if we do the math, this is what we need to have a safe detection in the lab. And we know the partitioning into polyethylene. So we're looking at deployment times of at least four weeks. And we needed, we thought, on the order of two grams of polyethylene to be sure to have enough mass for the dioxin and furan detection. For the water column part, we followed an approach where we needed performance reference compounds. And um, well, we need performance reference compounds for the poor water too. But in the water column, we needed several performance reference compounds, which then fit into this equation where we have to determine what fraction of the compound has equilibrated and to what degree we have to correct for this. And in this particular equation to derive concentrations, the concentration of the passive sampler we measure in the lab, the partitioning constant we know from lab studies and literature values. And the only unknown is basically in this equation is the sampling rate RS time we know, the mass of the sampler we know, and the partition constants we know. So we use a range of PSCs and then using a best fit approach solve for the sampling rate that is behind this particular uptake curve and use that to derive fraction equilibrium for all other compounds. To give you some idea what we're talking about, typical sampling range in the Pasega River was around 10 liters a day. So that is roughly the volume of water that the sampler extracted the contaminants of concern from on a given basis. So over a for week deployment, we roughly sampled the equivalent of 300 liters of water. So that, of course, shows the strength of the passive sampling approach where all these chemicals are accumulated through simple diffusion. So to jump into some of the results, this is for the pore water test. So we had shown you these um, circular devices we deployed in mud bank flats along the Passaic River and in slightly deeper part of the Passaic River. And at the same time, we took sediment back to the lab, equilibrated it in, on a shaker table with a passive sampler, some biocide, and some water. So we had a slurry with a passive sampler. And we used two, two different thicknesses in the lab, a 25 micron and a 51 micron thick polyethylene sheet. 
So those are the lab equilibrations. This is, would be the orange and the olive green bars. And then on the right-hand side is the reddish color. That's our in situ sampler results. And those were corrected using the GUI, the graphical user interface that SERDA has posted on its website that was developed by uh, Phil Geschwind, I believe, at MIT, and it has been widely used. So that's our in situ comparison. These concentrations of the PCBs in poor water, and you see in all cases the in situ and the ex situ results agree very nicely. Um, we have standard bars for the in situ because we had several deployments next to each other. And in all cases, this is sediment one on the order of hundreds of picograms per liter, very good agreement between both results. Sediment two was a little closer to the Superfund side. You can see of concentration are much higher. And again, very good agreement across the different homolog groups for the in-lab in results in orange and in green and the in-situ deployments in red, corrected with the GUI approach. We did the same comparison for dioxins. There's a couple of things to note. First, the colors are the same. The first two bars, orange and green, are lab-based equilibrations of the sediment. And the red with the standard deviation is the field deployed passive samplers in situ. Again, corrected using the graphic user interface, so the, the GUI approach. What you see here are dioxins from monochlorinated all the way to octachlorinated. And the most prevalent ones are mono, di, and tri, and we get good agreement. But of course, if you work with the dioxins, the ones we care about most have at least four chlorines and are substituted in, in the two, three, seven, and eight positions. So on the next slide, we have included now here on the top right insert the compounds that are of more concern for regulators because these are all the toxic congeners. So for example, here is 2378 TCDD, there is 2378 TCDF, so the compounds that have known toxicity. And what we compare here is the equilibration of the lab, that is the, um, the bars on the right in the slide orange rose color. So that's our reference value. That's the, the, the lab-based results. And the left three bars, blue, red, and green, are different ways of correcting our in situ results depending on which performance reference compounds we use. And typically, we only used deuterated pHs and a range of polybrominated biphenyls. But during discussion with SERDAP, during technical review, it was suggested that to make sure our dioxin numbers are accurate, we should also include the much more expensive carbon-13 labeled dioxins. So in this particular case, we included three carbon labeled dioxins in our passive samplers as performance reference compounds, and we now just explore which set of um, performance reference compounds works best to get the right numbers. So the right number, as far as we can tell, is the bar on the right always. That's the rose colored. And it looks like the red bars are often closest, and the red bars are indeed, when we use carbon labeled dioxins as performance reference compound for the in situ sampling deployments. So it adds some cost, but the gain is a high accuracy of getting poor water or water column measurements of dioxins. Next, we wanted to look at the same compounds being in the river. So the water column, in this case, the Pacific River is not a very deep river, but of course, the concern is that contaminants leave the sediment, get into the river and into the food web. So we deployed passive samplers in the water column. We learned over time that while passive samplers are very cheap, they sometimes get lost if we don't have an appropriate deployment design. And we included here a cage-like system, very porous, but giving physical protection to the sampler during deployment, recovery, and while it is in the water column. So we have this stainless steel mesh here, very with wide openings. And then we have hookups where we can add rope and or weights to keep the samplers suspended. In this case, we focused on polybrominated diphenyl ethers because they are somewhat newer compounds. They are a little bit tricky to analyze because they're very hydrophobic. And again, we used, in this case, we used three brominated biphenyls as performance reference compounds because they're also brominated, they're structurally very close. As I said before, we follow this equation where we have to fit the sampling rate and then we can solve for any and every compound that we're interested in measuring at the site. 
For comparison, we also have some forwarder concentration and they were from lab equilibrations only. So the first thing we did is we deployed our passes and we took an active sample using a glass fiber filter followed by two polyurethane foam plugs for sampling the so-called dissolved phase. And the comparison here on the left is the concentration of PBDEs being dissolved in the water of the Passaic River from pumping it. And on the x-axis, we have concentration of PBDEs that we derived from the passive samplers. Uh, for optimists, I included a one-to-one -one line. So if all the measured data points were on the one-to-one -one line, we get perfect agreement. We can say, yes, the passive sampling is fantastic. I mean, it still is fantastic, but the comparison initially was very poor. And we have got much higher concentrations from the active sampling. And of course, we know that there's a problem of active sampling as in any compounds that bind to colloids, those colloids are not retained by the glass fiber filter. So they are captured by the polyurethane foam plug or any other adsorbents you might want to use. And just to give you an illustration of how bad the problem was, the concentration of the active sampling were on average 45 times higher than what we determined using the passive sampling approach. Now, we did measure the DOC in those river samples and it was on average around five milligrams per liter. And there's uh, published values of how strongly hydrophobic organic contaminants do uh, partition onto dissolved organic carbon. And the typical range is around a tenth of its partitioning to, and um, the KOW partition between octanol and water. So if we use our known concentration of DOC and the known partitioning, and we correct our active sampling, we now have a um, an agreement between active and passive sampling that is much, much better. We have an agreement that's around 1.4, so we're only 40% higher in the active sampling corrected for DUC than in the passive. And that, I think, is probably as good as we can do it because the passive samplers were out for four weeks. The active sampling we did twice at the beginning and at the end, and we cannot capture all the fluctuation. Of course, we would argue that using a passive sampler, we are much more interested in the average concentration over the time than knowing what, what was happening at any given particular point in time. On the right-hand side now are these corrected, DOC corrected active concentrations versus those derived from the passive sampler, what is freely dissolved. These are the green points, and they indeed now cluster nicely around the one-to-one -one line. And actually, we have a slope that is not significantly different from one, and we have a intercept that is not significantly different from zero, so we actually have good agreement. Of course, the reason I take you through all of this is that we wanted to convince ourselves, CERDAP and any other users, that the passive sounders yield concentrations that are manageable, reflect something real, and are reproducible. And so this was one line of evidence that we could summon to show that, yes, indeed, the active sampling can be reconciled with the passive sampling and the lab work and labor with the passive sampling is much reduced and gives us, we think, much more meaningful results. We, of course, did not only look for PBDEs, as I mentioned initially. We also looked for pHs, PCBs, and dioxins. And at that stage, it seemed that the affinity for the DOC to get the same level of agreement between active and passive was not always the same. And we'll look into that further down the road. But I think the key takeaway is that the passive and active sampling can be, the results can be reconciled, they can yield the same results. Next, we wanted to actually use the, the sampling of the water column contaminants to look into the geochemistry of partitioning in the water column. And again, the intent is here not only to, to show some fancy geochemistry, but to make the point that the results we get with the passive sampler do support our knowledge of what happens in such an aquatic system. So on the left-hand side, you see a comparison of the partitioning of contaminants between being dissolved and binding to particles in the water column. And this is from the active sampling correct for DOC. And so the observed partition between organic carbon and water on the y-axis is plotted as a function of KOW on the x-axis. And we expect the nice straight line that increases, reflecting that as compounds become more hydrophobic at this end, the partitioning to K organic carbon in the water column becomes more attractive. So KOW being a good proxy here. You see this correlation not very strong on the right-hand side. 
we have the same comparison, but now we use the passive sampling results and the measured partition to particles in the water column. And you see we have a much stronger correlation, a much tighter line. The range of KOCs also increases much more. So we're talking from 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 8, whereas on the actives it was much reduced. So the bottom line from our end is that the passive sampling gives better results than if you do active sampling and correction for DOC. And the results are meaningful and confirm to what we know about how partitioning, how contaminants should partition in a system like a river. Of course, there's a follow-up that is um, always of interest to us working in this particular system of the Newark Bay and Passaic River. That's the question, to what degree does black carbon play an additional role? All the initial work on sediments always said you have to know KOC and FOC, so how much organic carbon is present, and to what degree do the contaminants partition between the organic carbon and the, water, uh, and the pore water or the water column, and that would explain everything you need to know in the system. And through numerous studies, we know that it's not sufficient. Those parameters only explain a fraction, so we have to account for the observed absorption to, with some other parameters, and the one that Oyan Gustafsson, Phil Schwent, and others have proposed was to include a black carbon term. And we can even see the effect in the water column of that river. So we have the left-hand side. We just look at organic carbon partitioning. Then we predict what is here on this one-to-one -one line. And the observed, the measurements of using the passive samplers are on the y-axis. And most of these measured data points are well above the one-to-one -one line by up to an order of magnitude. And that shows actually there is stronger sorption than expected. If we now include a second term that captures the partition to black carbon, we have a much tighter fit. We're much closer to the one-to-one -one line. And so we, we see evidence that even in the water column of this particular river, the black carbon, the soot particles, play a role that can help us understand the strength of sorption. Of course, typically, you would have heard about black carbon in sediments. So this is, we did the same work in sediments. We have the prediction based on partitioning just to organic carbon on the x-axis. We have all of our measured data points on the y-axis. And you see almost all the data points are 10 to 100 times above what is predicted from the simple FOC KOC partitioning approach. This option is stronger than expected. And of course, we now include a black carbon term. We measured it in sediment. And again, we get a much tighter clustering. So again, this reinforces the point that the measurement we can do with a passive sampler gives us a very relevant parameter, the freely dissolved concentration, and we can justify the, the, those numbers through either comparison to active sampling and correcting for DOC or taking sediment from the, from the field into the lab, partition, uh, equilibrated and derived partitioning values. And we can explain the observed lower concentrations through geochemistry. The other part that Sutter was interested in this was to have a sampler that will indeed show trends over space and time that are robust and meaningful so that can indeed be used to assess the spread of contamination and how this changes, particularly when remediative, remedia, remedial actions are taken. So we go back to the Passaic River. There's a known high-end contamination of around, around this, this elbow here, this bend in the river. And so this is the concentration, excuse me, the concentration of PCBs summed in the river at these different sites, going from near the dam all the way into Newark Bay. And what we see is concentrations start off at, at a few hundreds picograms per liter, at the northern end increase towards a few nanograms per liter towards the heavily contaminated lower part of the Passaic River, and then in Newark Bay are slightly below. So this is a trend that is pretty consistent with what we know about the site and the characteristics of the contamination at the time and how it is spread. So this would indicate to us that the spatial component we can capture quite well. The other question was how, we, how well we capture the temporal trends. And I know this slide looks busy, it probably is, but I wanted to keep it that way because it shows two trends at once. And I think this is helpful to illustrate. We go from mile 18, that is close to the dam in the north, all the way towards the high end of contamination and end up in Newark Bay. So there's a spatial trend here. And each plot has a temporal trend. The 
um, the line shows temperature. We go from winter all the way through summer and then back to fall. And you can see no matter which plot you look at that, we see a strong increase of concentrations as the temperature increases, then we get into the summer and fall. And we think this is well explained by previous studies that have shown that bioturbation of sediments releases contaminants from the poor water into the water column. So again, these temporal trends are consistent with previous observation and suggest that indeed the samplers are useful in the field. Um, just for an obvious point to make here is we compared here the activity, or you could say the concentration of PCBs in the poor water, that's on the y-axis versus concentration in the river water. And for almost all cases and points, there's much higher concentration of PCBs in the poor water than in the overlying river. And that, of course, means the site is contaminated through its sediments and the sediments release contaminants back into the river where the animals live. And of course, that is why we have to do some remediation of the sediments. The right-hand side, you see the same graph for dioxins, a similar trend, most contaminants, most dioxins have a higher concentration in the poor water. So again, there will be net flux out of those sediments. All right, a last busy graph, but I was somewhat um, able to slip it by startups, watchful eyes of not having any confusing graphs. This is just an analysis we did a few weeks ago and published it in ETNC. We looked at the entire food web of in the Passaic River from which we had samples. That goes all the way from crabs to striped bass. These are all these different data points. And then we are going to go back to the sediment and say, can our measurement of parameters in the sediment explain the presence of contaminants high up in the food web? And so on the top left graph, we see organic carbon in the sediment, and we then predict what will be partitioning. And most points are well above the one-to-one -one line. And that means we actually overestimate the contamination in the food web if we just look at sedimentary organic carbon. On the right-hand side, same comparison, but now we include black carbon, and you see the fit gets better. And we have points that are close to the one-to-one -one line, but we actually see a lot of the compounds of concern are slightly underestimated now. Down the bottom left graph is now using the poor water measurement with a passive sampler. The fit is basically similarly maybe a little bit better than the organic carbon, black carbon approach. But again, we have numerous compounds which are underestimated if we use the poor water as a measure of bioaccumulation. And it turns out that most of the chemicals that are down here underestimated are those that are strong biomagnifying in that food web. So it seems the poor water measurement itself is not sufficient to fully capture what is present in top level predator fish in this ecosystem. And the last one is we use the river the river measurement of the passive samplers, you see it's not as tight and we have basically always an underestimation because the river water is not sufficient to explain the accumulation we find. All right, our ongoing work is to test these samplers on a device that we can throw into the mud and get back out without a diver and we're playing with an anchor design to be continued, maybe at, an, maybe at another webinar at this beautiful location. And so let me wrap up. What we did is to construct a sediment pore water and water column multisem that's based on polyethylene. And it was designed to particularly focus on dioxins and furans. So we needed a lot of contaminants being taken up by the sampler to overcome detection limits, but also be used for a range of other hydrophobic organic contaminants as PCBs, pesticides, or PBDEs. We tried to develop this without having to rely on divers. To make sure the numbers make sense, we compared ex situ and in situ results, and they were very positive and strong. And we hope that at the next step to use this to predict the accumulation of these contaminants by benthic animals and then the food web. And I hopefully, at least, I've tried to convince you that we have shown that the results from these multi samplers in the water column and in the poor water are basically reasonably explained by everything we know about partitioning and correction for other com competing phases. So we can say we kind of validated that both the poor water and the river water sampler. And we think it's an important tool that we can use to assess contaminated sites and be used during the remediation monitoring. 
And of course, why DOD was interested, I assume, is because at many sites, there's more than one contaminant, and this polyethylene can indeed be used to target many of these hydrophobic contaminants at the same time in the water column and in the sediment. And I think we have shown that indeed those passive parameters match other results and can be used to interrogate spatial and temporal trends. With that, um, there are some publications that we are involved with from this, salt, from this work, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Reiner. As a reminder for our audience, you can submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. We have received a number of questions on the first portion of this presentation that Reiner will answer. And Reiner, this is a question from the U.S. Army Engineer and Research Development Center. Um, can you discuss how to load the performance reference compounds on the polyethylene, including considerations such as ethanol water ratios and loading times? Yeah, thank you for the question. We follow the, I think it's Case Boy's recipe. It's 80% um, water, 20% methanol. We add our mixture in methanol. To those, we load 20, 25 samples at one time in a, I think it's a two liter, sorry, it's a two liter jar. And we shake it for four weeks. We're not really in a hurry. Um, because we want to make sure that those are well distributed by the passive samplers or within the passive samplers. Great, thank you. Um, your data seems to suggest that the in situ and ex situ results are somewhat similar. Can you please elaborate on the need for sampling in situ? Uh, that sounds more like a question for Andrea, but. I think there's some evidence from other work that Sadab has also supported that the in situ results might differ from what you get if you take the sediment back to the lab. And there seems to be an interest in getting results in situ. Um, it's, of course, more labor intensive to do the, all the deployments in the field, but of course, it's, it's the numbers that we really want to know what's happening in the sediment as it is in the field without being disturbed. Once we grab the sediment, take it to the lab, we force it to equilibrium, we, we homogenize it, so we get a slightly different answer. It turns out in this particular place where we work that we get the same results. So if I was in charge of this particular site, I'd say you don't have to do it all in situ because the ex situ is much cheaper and easier. But at other sites, it is of concern. So I guess the trend is towards doing everything in situ now. Great, thank you. Um, how successful have you been at retrieving your samplers in the field? Uh, I think that's always a learning curve. And of course, I'll never, I don't want to jinx my next deployment. Initially, we had difficulty because we put in brand new buoys that were shiny and said, URI, don't touch. Or, no, we, I think we just said research only. And that wasn't working out too well. So we learned to camouflage our floats, if their surface floats a little better, and now use the items that look a little more like trash. And that has certainly helped us recover samplers. And we haven't really lost any during the deployments I just showed. For the in situ passive sample deployments, we relied on uh, deploying them at low tide and mud flats, and then just having a rope going back to land. And of course, that rope wouldn't be visible most of the time. So I think we just learn to camouflage our deployments so that they're not of interest to anybody walking around. Great, thank you. And I have a question from the Department of Energy and Environment related to the regulatory and practical acceptance of using passive samplers in general, given that the analytical methods may be different um, than EPA approved methods. Um, what, how does your work help us um, to advance the state of knowledge regarding uh, regulatory acceptance and wide usage uh, in the, you know, within the consulting and the uh, federal community? I think SERDAP has done a tremendous job of pulling in regulators to some degree and 
commercial laboratories or consultancies to help advance the use of these passives. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the guidance documents that have been released by SODA involving Robert Burgess from EPA. So there's detailed documents that show how, what and how you can use passives. And I think there are current efforts involving a range of commercial laboratories to make sure that the expertise is present to use performance reference compounds that are useful in the field and have standard operating procedures and manuals that give useful and meaningful and accurate results from those past summers. So I think it's a very important push that needs to continue to make sure that indeed eventually anybody who's in charge of a contaminated site can rely on a passive if it's appropriate for the site. But for most contaminated sediment sites, I think they are always a better option than anything else we have. Excellent, thank you. Um, how does sediment sampling of polychlorinated dioxins and furans differ from that of other contaminants? And are there specific additional challenges related to these compounds? Well, the simple answer is <laughs> it's all the same, except the contaminants are present at much, much lower concentrations. So it's, I think some of the challenges we had to overcome with our approach was just to make sure that we're able to accumulate sufficient amount of the dioxins and furans so that we can run our analysis well. And I probably didn't point out the dissolved concentration, the pore water concentration of the dioxins are in the picogram per liter or below range. So they're present at low concentrations. But because of the known toxicity, that is still enough to cause concern and indeed cause EPA to, pr to propose to dredge the entire lower Pacific River. So the challenge is, is they're present at much lower concentration. Because of that, you need to accumulate more higher mass of them. And that means either you have a bigger passive number, it takes longer. And then during the analysis of dioxins, that it's very detailed, but you need additional cleanup steps. So it's a more laborsome procedure. So it just adds time resources to get dioxin and furan concentrations in the water or poor water. Great. Uh, one last quick question before we transition to the second part of this webinar. Uh, this is a question from the University of Iowa. Uh, given that biological processes that transform hydrophobic organic compounds seem ubiquitous in river sediments. Can you see evidence of these processes in the in-situ passive sampler measurement? Wow, that sounds like an excellent segue for, for, for Kevin's presentation. Um, do we see evidence? We haven't looked at whether, we, whether the mixture we measure is different from what it should be based on the known, let's say, use of an aeroclone mixture, for example. And we haven't looked at any hydroxylated PCBs or dioxins, for that matter. I mean, they will still accumulate in the passive sun if we just haven't looked for them. So I cannot really give a good answer. Apologies. No worries. But I, I do agree with you. This is a good segue into uh, Kevin's presentation. We'll get back with additional questions to you um, towards the end of the webinar, Reiner. Thank you. All right, so this um, second part of today's presentation will be delivered by Dr. Uh, Kevin Sowers. Kevin is the Associate Director of the Institute of Marine and Environmental Technology um, and also professor at the University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County. Uh, one of Kevin's research areas for the past 20 years has focused on the process of microbial dechlorination of PCBs and the development of sustainable institute technologies for treating PCB contaminated sites. Kevin is currently conducting field trials in collaboration with federal, municipal, and private stakeholders. And his research has generated over 75 peer reviewed journals, 20 book chapters, and several patents. Kevin received his doctoral degree in microbiology from Virginia Tech. Kevin, please proceed. Kevin? All right, I'm here. I have my right. mute on, sorry. 
Anyway, I'd like to thank Yerula and Andrea for the opportunity to uh, talk about our research. Uh, what I'll be talking about today is actually the culmination of um, over 20 years of work on trying to understand how microbes react with PCBs. And, and we've been mainly focused on reductive dechlorination, but as you'll see here, we're going to also be talking about uh, degradati degradative processes as well. Okay. And I'm just having a little problem. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to cover is the, uh, we'll go through the objectives of the research, some of the background on the work. Uh, and then I'll go through a description of the technology, the site we uh, worked on in our ESTCP funded project, um, a treatability study we conducted there as well as the field study, and then summarize our results and where we stand right now. So the benefits to DOD, uh, many DOD sites are impacted with PCBs and uh, polychlorinated biphenyls. Um, Across the country, in many places, it's only second to mercury in terms of fish advisories. And so it's a, uh, a prevalent contaminant that we're still dealing with, even though it's a legacy contaminant. And uh, DOD, as well as uh, other sites around the country and around the world, um, are, are um, subject to this, this, this BCB issue. Uh, the current technologies include dredging and capping. Uh, these, in some cases, can be very destructive to the environment. So if you're working in an environmentally sensitive area, such as a wetland, um, you know, uh, alternative technologies might be more favorable than these approaches. And in some cases, dredging a capy may not reduce the risk sufficiently. The advantages of coming up with an in-situ treatment using biomedic activated carbon is uh, at lower cost than dredging. Uh, this technology both sequesters the PCBs using the activated carbon and then the bacteria that are present then continue to degrade the PCBs. It can be rapidly deployed, it's minimally, minimally invasive, so we can get in and out of a site relatively quickly, quickly with a uh, uh, minimum amount of heavy equipment. Uh, reduces the risk associated with sediment disruption. Uh, because it's, uh, we require very little uh, equipment for deployment, it's a reduced carbon footprint, and there's no extensive waste management habitat restoration associated with, uh, with it afterwards. So the technical objectives of the ESTCP project were to demonstrate and validate the, um, the biomended activated carbon uh, at a site. And in this case, we uh, chose a site at the uh, Marine, base, Marine Corps Base Quantico. Uh, the specific goals were to demonstrate that one, that we could mass culture the amendment, transport the site, and actually deliver it to the sediments without losing the viability of the microorganisms themselves. Uh, we need, wanted to demonstrate that the treatment uh, would actually reduce both the total mass of the PCBs as well as the aqueous concentrations of the PCBs and also show that the treatment had a minimal effect on the actual microbial community that is present at the site. So first I want to go into how bioremediation works. Uh, we've known since the 80s uh, with work at the Hudson River and General Electric that um, there are organisms that reductively dechlorinate PCBs. Um, but for a long time, we didn't know what these organisms were. So um, what we know now is that these respiring, halo respiring bacteria actually respire PCBs. So they reduce uh, carbon at the uh, site of a chlorine and essentially replace the chlorine with a hydrogen, produce HCl. And uh, this is how they make a living by respiring the PCBs. And generally, the respiring organisms will attack higher chlorinated PCBs. So they'll attack PCB congeners uh, that have flanking chlorines. And as long as there's a, a flanking chlorine on the ring, they generally can be attacked by uh, halorespiring bacteria. Once you have remaining chlorines, you get down to the tri and tetrachlorobiphenyls that no longer have uh, chlorine chlorine on uh, the carbon rings then the activity stops or slows down. There is evidence that there's some uh, bacteria that will respire uh, PCBs with lone chlorines, but uh, it's not very common. However, once you open up the two, three, and three, four positions of one of those rings, the PCBs are then vulnerable to the aerobic oxidizing bacteria. And these, uh, these microbes can then split the rings and through a series of reactions uh, via the biphenyl degradation pathway, 
uh, the PCBs can then be further broken down and eventually uh, oxidized completely and uh, mineralized. So in nature, it's these two complementary processes that break down PCBs during natural attenuation. So our goal was to uh, mimic this very, uh, this naturally occurring system to try and uh, bioremediate uh, PCBs uh, in a much more active, much faster way. So the question is, if natural attenuation occurs, and if these organisms are already out there, and they are ubiquitous in the environment, you can go just, just about anywhere, and you'll find both the uh, PCB aerobic PCB degrading bacteria and the PCB halorespiring bacteria. The question is, why is natural attenuation so slow then? Well, this is some work by Lombard and others uh, in 2014. And what they showed uh, using a passive dosing uh, system where it actually could dose, uh, using a passive sampler, dose a known amount of PCB, and then look at the kinetics of degradation at different PCB concentrations in the um, aqueous phase. And what we were able to model based on that was the uh, activity. We found that it was, uh, uh, the activity was first order rate kinetics. And we also found that PCB concentrations down to one nanogram per liter, which is the lowest we could measure at that time, uh, you still saw active uh, respiration. So the process wasn't limited by the low concentrations you normally see in the uh, environment. In fact, uh, down to one nanogram per liter, it was still quite active. When this was modeled, what we found it is that if you increase the number of cells, uh, as shown here, you actually increase the rate of reductive dechlorination by increasing that titer. And just as a reference, 10 to the three cells per mil, this is pretty characteristic of the number of cells, uh, halo respires, you'd actually see in the environment. So you can see by this, the actual rate uh, by natural attenuation would be quite slow. But by increasing the number of cells, you then increase that rate. And the whole idea behind bioremediation is actually add, artificially increase that population in the environment. And there's some sub subsequent work that's not shown here. Uh, Trevor Needham, uh, there's a publish that's been submitted. This is with Paul Gosha's lab, where he's actually looked at the kinetics of dehalo respiration, as well as the, the rates of desorption from organic material. And what he found is that there's a, a fraction that's rapidly desorbing, which would fall in right about here, and a fraction that's slow desorbing, which would fall in right about here. And the goal of this of bioremediation is to try and get the cell numbers up into this range of the fast desorbing compounds and the low desorbing PCBs, so that as those PCBs are desorbed, they're then metabolized by the bacteria. So we now know a lot more about what's going on in the environment. We know what the bottlenecks are. And so at this stage, you know, we felt comfortable going back to the environment and trying to use bioremediation. Other factors that were important in, this, in, in being able to do this are one, we now have a number of halo respiring bacteria that'll uh, attack PCBs. We also have aerobic bacteria. These have been isolated, they've been characterized, and we know much more about them now. Secondly, we've developed methods for actually monitoring them. And we have uh, gene probes that we can use that will actually monitor these, specifically these bacteria against the background of naturally occurring bacteria. So we can actually quantitatively measure their titer in the environment after they're added. Third, we've learned to mass culture them. And more importantly, we've learned to mass culture them without using PCBs because it's very difficult to get rid of PCBs in order to put the microorganisms back in the environment. So what we use is we use chlorinated ethenes, uh, which the ALO respirers will also use. And then we can sparge it because they're volatile. We can sparge them out, um, actually concentrate the cells, and then take them back to the environment. So we can eliminate the problem of adding PCBs back to the environment or any other kind of uh, POP. And finally, we needed a delivery system. We needed a way to get the microorganisms back into the sediments. And this is when we began working with uh, Sediment Solutions and their product, uh, Sedimite. So this is an agglomerate of 50% activated carbon with sand and clay binders. So these are all naturally occurring ingredients. And it's heavier than water. So these pellets can actually be 
uh, put into a water column, they drop into the sediments, and then the pellets dissipate and the carbon particles are then uh, worked into the sediment by bioturbation. By applying our microorganisms to this, we, they then uh, piggyback on the carbon particles and are introduced down into the sediments. And this is some work by Kaposi et al., a paper that just came out in biofouling, showing the formation, of, and this is uh, on here, these are uh, halorespiring bacteria on a uh, activated carbon particle, and uh, this is using uh, cyber green. And you can see how the bacteria adsorb to the particle and then this particle is then introduced into the sediments. And so uh, this is the carrier system, and the way it works is that uh, these pellets, once we add the bacteria to them, can be applied into sediments by a, a number of means. We've used a, um, an air horn. This is a compressed air distributor. It actually creates a suction, the compressed air, the compressor's on shore. Uh, it, it creates a suction in the venturi and draws the pellets up and they can be applied in this way. Uh, a telebelt can be used or even a, a pellet broadcaster off a boat in order to apply these pellets uh, into the environment and create a thin layer of uh, activated carbon and microorganisms. So for the ESTCP project, uh, the site we chose was Abrams Creek. This is on Marine Corps Base Quantico. This was an active training site. And so one of the criteria is we had to be able to get in and out of there uh, within a, a very short window of time. We had about one week. Um, it's an eight acre site. It's a, a watershed outflow that eventually flows out to the Chapawamsic uh, River and then out to the Potomac River. It was, uh, it's contaminated with an average of five parts per million of PCB. We believe it was 1260 originally based on the uh, forensics of the uh, congener distribution. And we had four treatments there, uh, four 400 square meter plots, which we did different treatments. And I'll talk about those in a little while. And we had a loading rate of about one ton of sedimite per plot uh, that contained 10 to the 12 cells for each plot. Uh, the other reason we chose it is um, we had a nice access road, so we had very easy access uh, and, uh, and to the staging area and to the site itself. So initially we did a treatability study and we did these in a uh, recirculating uh, tank system. We had designed essentially what happens is we took sediment from the site, we took water from the site, and we have uh, linear manifolds on each end. What would happen is the water would slowly pass through the tank uh, with an exchange rate of about once per hour. It would go down into a flask, it would be sparged with air, and then that would be pumped back into the tank. And in this way, we replicated the oxygen level up in the water column and the sediment, whatever portion uh, redox gradient was formed would form naturally as it would in the environment. And we did different treatments here. We did uh, no treatment. We did sedamite alone. We did sedamite supplemented with some cellulose as a slow release carbon source. We tried uh, sedamite with, with cellulose using different concentrations of the anaerobe, which is DF1, and the aerobe, LB400, and 10 to the three cells per gram of sediment, 10 to the four and 10 to the five. We did 10 to the five of that combination without cellulose to see if that uh, was required or not. And then we tried a combination of other halo respiring bacteria that we had in the lab. And the results show, are shown here. In the left graph, uh, here are the various treatments I just talked about. And we found that the uh, mass of PCBs, the, the extent of uh, degradation of PCBs was greatest with 10 to the fifth cells, 10 to the fifth uh, of LB400 and 10 to the fifth of DF1 per gram of sediment. Uh, that seemed to be the best combination. Uh, fewer cells, we saw less mass reduction, and with different halo respires, they weren't, they were effective, but they weren't quite as effective. So this seemed to be the best combination uh, for the total mass reduction. In terms of pore water, we saw a 97% reduction in the pore water concentration of PCBs with this particular treatment. So without bioamendment, there was no significant reduction of PCB mass. 
Dioxin-like congeners, which we also looked at, uh, were reduced by 90%. So the 12 dioxin-like congeners in PCBs, we saw a 90% reduction. It seemed that the DF1 LB400 combination catalyzed the greatest reduction in mass. And we saw a reduction concentration of a co the full congener range from mono to nona chlorobiphenol. So we were seeing in the nona chlorobiphenols, uh, we were seeing, we knew that this was reductive dechlorination. These were halo respires. And once you get to the lesser chlorinated PCBs, uh, you're seeing aerobic degradation. So we saw the full range. So for the field study, we had the four plots. Plot number one was a control untreated. Plot number two was the sedamite with cellulose, but no bioamendment. And plots three and four were uh, replicate plots with uh, bioamendment, cetamite, and cellulose. We produced, we had uh, uh, cetamite produced, actually it was closer to 3,000 kilograms. Uh, it contained 50% activated carbon, 30% sand, 20% binder, and 0.1% uh, cellulose in this case. Uh, these were loaded in bulk bag bags and they were actually shipped to the site. For production of bioamendments, we actually produce these here at, uh, we have a pilot scale-up facility here in our, our lab. And uh, for the anaerobe, we, we were able to scale up 10 to the 13th cells, which is the number we needed for those two plots, using a 250 liter pilot scale bioreactor. And again, this is without PCBs, this is using chlorinated ethenes so that we could harvest them by centrifugation. It was a continuous centrifuge. We could purge it, harvest, and then we concentrated them in uh, Cornelius flasks, these um, 20 liter stainless steel containers. Sealed under, the anaerobe was sealed under nitrogen, and the aerobe, which was grown in a 20 liter bioreactor, was just transferred directly to one of these canisters, and they were shipped to the site separately. So for the deployment, we had uh, 3,000 kilograms of biomented cetamide, and we used uh, an air horn. This is the Venturi device. And uh, as I mentioned before, plot one was not treated. Plot two, this was uh, no bioamendment with just the uh, activated carbon, the cetamide, and cellulose. And then these two contained the bioamendment. Compressor was here back on the road, and then using a boat, uh, the uh, material was uh, added to the site. The final sedamite concentration was 0.3 grams for 10 grams of sediment. So this is less than we'd normally use if we were just using activated carbon. The final amendment concentration was 10 to the six cells per 10 grams of sediment, or 10 to the fifth per gram, which we determined in the treatability study would be the optimal concentration. We then sampled those uh, plots at time zero, 140 days and 409 days after treatment. So for the field study results, what we found is that we saw in the two bioamended plots, we saw a 30% reduction in mass after 409 days and a 52% reduction after 409 days. And the reason for this discrepancy, even though the plots were identical, was that we found that there was a lot of uneven distribution of the uh, bioamended carbon. So uh, in here, we found that depending on where we sampled, some samples had a much higher concentration of carbon and some were much lower. And in the case of plot four, two of the samples that we had actually had almost 15% carbon. And in having the carbon, they also had a much higher concentration of the amendment. So we believe the difference between these plots was just to do, due to uneven distribution. And this is an engineering issue. If we were to do a large area, we wouldn't use an air horn uh, it's very easy to get it even. The, the air horn is great for doing uh, the coastal areas, under piers, hard to access areas, small areas that you wouldn't access by other means. But using a pellet spreader or a telebelt would be much more efficient for a large area and you could get it much more even. We saw in addition to that an 80% reduction in coplanar PCBs in plot four. And in the untreated plots, we saw no significant difference. So again, any difference you see here is due to the bio amendment, not the carbon. Um, also below 7.5 centimeters, which presumably would be below the, the benthic air region, we didn't see any change. And we would expect this because 
the carbon has to be mixed into the sediment by natural means. And we depend on the activity of benthic organisms to mix the carbon and the bio, bio amendment in. So below 7.5 centimeters, there is no natural mixing. We essentially form this uh, cleaner layer of, on the, in the top 7.5 centimeters as a result of bioturbation. Looking at the dissolved PCBs, the PCV decrease in the bioamendment plots is shown here after 409 days again. Um, with no bioamendment, but with carbon, we saw a 62% reduction, which you'd expect because we'd expect some absorption by the carbon. But again, this isn't uh, as much as you would have gotten if we put a normal dose of carbon in, which is generally three to 5% rather than 1.5%. But we wanted to show the effect of the bioamendment itself. And as you can see with the bioamendment, we had 84 and 95% reduction in the, in the uh, dissolved PCB concentration as a result of adding the bioamendment. Now I'll point out, this is after only 409 days. And in other tests, we've small tests we've done at other sites, we found that in the environment, generally uh, it can take uh, two and a half years to achieve what we see in the lab. As far as the microorganisms themselves, we looked at the titer of the hail respirer and the aerobe. And uh, what we found was that this is the aerobic degrader. We saw a decline over the course of the year, which we expect because this is a co-metabolic process. This organism does not grow on PCBs. Uh, it depends on other compounds to grow on. So after the initial dose, the population generally levels off to a much lower number. We, we go down about two to three orders of magnitude. We see some evidence of them in plot one and two is probably as a result of some carryover from the treatment of these plots, because we know those organisms aren't present in the background. Uh, I think I skipped over the anaerobic calorie Again, we see a decrease in the number of organisms, and um, we see a little bit of carryover in plot one and two. Uh, the halo respire does grow on uh, PCBs, but as the PCBs become less bioavailable, as the amount decreases, it can no longer support a large population like we've added. The reason the low numbers occur in the environment is because PCBs are not terribly soluble, and therefore they can't support a large population of uh, PCB halo respires. So we don't expect this large titer that we initially add to remain that high because the amount of PCB there is just not going to support that. So most of that activity occurs in here. We would expect the, the numbers that maybe taper off a little bit more, but still be quite a bit higher than would be naturally occurring in the environment. We looked at the indigenous population. We did a community analysis, and uh, this is a Shannon diversity index. And what we found is that within each plot, that we, although there were differences between plots, that within each plot, there were no significant differences uh, in terms of within the plot, time points, or depth. And uh, what we found is plot four itself was significantly more diverse uh, throughout the study than the other plots. So the, the bottom line is the bioaugmentation, the addition of the activated carbon didn't significantly alter the total uh, uh, microbial diversity on a macro scale. Cost assessment, uh, we're often asked what's this gonna cost compared to other technologies. And, and if you look at this last column here, the total annualized cost, uh, the biomended sedamite is quite competitive with other technologies, especially compared to uh, dredging and offsite disposal and uh, thick capping. And the biomended sedamite compared to sedamite alone, it's about 50, costs about 50% 50 more than just using the activated carbon. But the advantage is you're actually reducing the mass of PCBs over time. So in summary, the bio amendments uh, were effectively mass cultured. They were transported to the site and we were able to deliver them into the sediments uh, without significant loss of viability. There was significant reduction in both the total and soluble PCBs in the bio amended plots after 409 days. And as I said, if we go back now, a couple years later, we would uh, hope to see, expect to see much more reduction over time. There was a significant reduction in the toxic equivalency associated with coplanar PCBs, particularly in bioamended plot number four. There was no significant effect on the indigenous bacteria and the long-term effects of the treatment 
uh, are yet to be determined. We have to get back there and see what the longer term effects are. Um, with that, I just wanted to mention the, uh, my coworkers on this, who Paul Ghosh, which was a co-PI on the project, and Hal May, who's worked with me for a number of years, for the past 20 years, on trying to identify these organisms and bring them back to the environment. Jeff Vance at Brightfields, who worked with us on this project. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. We have a number of questions that have come through for you. Uh, can you tell us if your proposed treatment can be used in sites where sediments are subject to disturbance from high currents or prop wash? It, it can be done. Um, one of the issues with using uh, thin layer cap like activated carbon is that it is susceptible to uh, prop wash and fast moving currents. It wouldn't be ideal in a fast moving river. Uh, however, if there are areas where this would need to be applied, uh, it could be applied and then stabilized with a heavier material like a, uh, a gravel to stabilize it. So you'd have this bioactive layer and then you would stabilize it by covering it with a, uh, a cap. And you wouldn't need as thick a cap as you would normally use. You'd use a thinner cap with a heavier gravel. Great, thank you. Uh, is the effectiveness of your treatment technology impacted by sedimentation? And if so, how? We would expect uh, if there is sedimentation that uh, most of the activity that occurs would be occurring in the first couple years and that layer would continue to be active. We would expect it then eventually with sedimentation to be covered over and Assuming that that sedimentation is clean, and generally you wouldn't want to treat a site unless you have already uh, treated any sources upstream, it would slowly be covered up with this cleaner material. So you'd still have an active cap, but then it would slowly become uh, covered up with the, uh, the clean material over time. And that, ideally, that's what you'd want to see. Great, thank you. Um, have you considered mixing your uh, microorganism concentrate into a simple silt and or sand matrix to provide a more uniform field application? Uh, uh, what was it, a sand matrix and what? Um, a simple silt and or sand matrix. One of the advantages of the carbon is that by adding the carbon, you're immediately sequestering the PCBs, and the organisms are on the surface of the carbon as the PCBs are absorbed. And they form a, they tend to form, uh, we believe, a biolayer on the carbon. Something like sand, uh, I'm not sure how the organisms would react with the sand if they'd form that biolayer or how they would. Uh, react with the PCBs using just the sand material. It's this adsorption property that adds an advantage to this because you've got two processes. You've got adsorb both adsorption and biological uh, breakdown of the PCBs. And I, I don't know how well sand would work. I don't have an answer for that. I haven't tried it. All right, thank you. And this is a question from the US Army Environmental Command. Would this technology work in a marine or salt water environment? Yes, we know the halo respire uh, can osmoregulate and we've used it in, uh, in the marine environment. So we can pre-grow it in marine medium, in estuarine medium, which we've done a number of times, or in freshwater medium, and it can adapt. We've, uh, the LB400, the aero will grow in an estuarine environment. We have not tried it in a marine environment. So we'd have to test it to see if it's capable of osmoregulating and adapting to the higher salt. Great, thank you. Um, is the sedimite hazardous to benthic aquatic life and or fish eggs? And um, with regards to fish eggs in terms of smothering potentially uh, the fish eggs? I don't know if those experiments have been done. I know there's been work done to look at the effect on benthic organisms, and there's a minimum effect on benthic organisms. Uh, 
obviously in our study, we wanted to see what the effect was on uh, other bacteria. That's why we did the community analysis. Um, but there, uh, there's very little effect, I know, on the benthic organisms. I don't know about uh, fish eggs and other types of wildlife. All right, thank you very much. Um, what was the sediment depth interval that was evaluated in the field study and what were the redox conditions over that interval? We took cores that were 12 inches deep. We uh, froze away the lowest six inches and we only processed that top uh, six inches. We uh, took the top three and the next three. So that was the 7.5 centimeters, the top 7.5 centimeter, and the lower 7.5 centimeters. These we processed. And as I said, we didn't see anything below this, the top 7.5 centimeters. Um, and we wouldn't expect anything uh, below that. As I say, this process really depends on natural bioturbation to mix the microorganisms in. Great, thank you. Um, a question from MECP, does the water temperature have any effect? Will the bacteria survive, for example, through the winter or potentially an ice cover? Yes, uh, we have another project. It was a smaller scale that we did in a, um, it's an old wastewater treatment pond. And that's gone through uh, several seasons now. And we find the bacteria are still there. They're lower, tighter. Uh, but they're present and they're active. So yes, they uh, in the laboratory, as I mentioned, things go very rapidly. We generally see an 80% reduction of PCBs uh, within about 12 months. In the environment, we're finding it takes longer. We believe that's because of the temperature fluctuations. But yes, the bacteria do survive those fluctuations. Thank you. And are there any inhibition effects on the microorganisms that you're introducing um, on the activated carbon? Have you looked at any sort of inhibition effects in natural environment? Uh, in the natural, because of the carbon or because of the environment? I'm not sure. We, we've looked- uh, Because we, of the environment, are there any factors that could inhibit the microorganisms when you bioaugment? And not that we've seen yet. Uh, we've we've had relatively high uh, metal concentrations, and that doesn't seem to affect them. We've had uh, co-contaminants like PAH is present, uh, particularly at this sewage treatment pond we're working at, and that doesn't seem to affect them. Uh, but we haven't done a systematic test to test a lot of different con compounds at a lot of different concentrations. Uh, this is just empirical. We haven't seen anything yet in different sites that inhibits them. Great, thank you. And at this point, I'd like to pull Reiner back into the discussion, but we'll start with you, Kevin, um, in, and have you uh, explore um, the potential for any regulatory barriers in terms of applying your technology following its uh, demonstration by startup and ESCCP? Well, the activated carbon itself is, right now that's that's an approved process by the, the EPA says it's, it's one of the processes that should be considered, you know, for a site. So the barrier with the carbon has already been surpassed. The organisms themselves are naturally occurring. They're not recombinant, they're non-pathogenic. And so I don't foresee any issues with the bacteria. The only difficulty would be, say, transporting it to another country if there are restrictions on putting microorganisms in the environment from another country, I could see a problem there. Um, Hawaii certainly has certain restrictions in that area, so I could see a barrier there. So it, it may depend on specific state laws, whether or not you can take bacteria from one part of the country and put it into another. But generally that hasn't been a problem with um, um, groundwater. I mean, we, we're already doing bioremediation for groundwater using microorganisms from one source in, in different parts of the country. So I don't foresee a major issue there. Great. And Reiner, for your um, passive samplers, do you anticipate any regulatory barriers towards commercialization and uh, wide use? 
I think the wide use is happening because it has certainly left the field of academia. Um, I don't know to what degree there are patents on passive samplers because a lot of it has come from different academic published efforts. So that part I'm not, I can't really speak to. Regulatory, um, I think acceptance is growing. So that's, I think, similar to the activated carbon amendment. Those, those are tools that have been, they've shown their utility and so they have indeed been incorporated into regulatory guidance documents so they can be used. Great, thank you. And, and as we try to wrap up here, Reiner, what are the next steps for your work? Can you reiterate those and um, try and articulate what one uh, last message you'd like to leave our audience with today about the use of passive samplers? I could try to quote a colleague who says, passive samplers are terrible, but they're much better than anything else you could come up with. But so what we are try trying to do next is to link the use the, the common concentrations we find in the pore water to predict accumulation by benthic organisms and then hopefully as I had shown briefly see whether we can use that concentration in the pore water to predict what's happening in the in the food web above the sediments. That of course would be an extremely powerful tool if we can use use a simple pore water measurement to predict what, what's going to be present in the higher higher trophic level fish that are of concern to regulators. Thank you very much. And Kevin, what last message would you like to leave our audience with? Well, I think our our goal, we've shown that this has the potential to work. Obviously, we haven't done a lot of field tests. So I think our goal here is to do as many field tests as possible uh, to continue to demonstrate that the, the process works, try and refine it as much as possible, try and determine if there are any other bottlenecks that uh, we need to deal with. We have a project coming up, two projects uh, that are uh, both projects less than an acre, slightly less than an acre, one in Delaware, one in Maryland, and uh, we'll be doing both of those this year and collecting more data. So our uh, hope is to get more data out there that people can see and convince them that this technology is a, a viable option. Great. Well, I'd like to thank you both for uh, great presentations and for entertaining the questions and answers. Uh, I mean, the questions during the Q&A session. Uh, at this point, I just would like to remind everyone on the line that the next webinar in the Startup and ESCCP webinar series is on Thursday, April 28th in the Weapons, Systems, and Platforms program area. This webinar will feature two speakers, Mr. James Dante from the Southwest Research Institute and Dr. Uh, Victor Rodriguez Santiago from the Naval Air Systems Command. Um, Jim and Victor will discuss their work on accelerated corrosion and aging studies. Uh, registration is open for this webinar. So please visit the CERTIP and ESCCP webinar webpage to register for this and other future webinars. Before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it if you can please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at this time. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your time.